conditions for such mobility, while scarce, does exist. In the Khalili collection is a Quran bearing the seal of Jani Beg Khan, the last independent ruler of Sindh before the Mughal conquest of 1592 during the reign of Akbar. While of uncertain provenance, the manuscript's opening folios follow in the style of late 15th century Hirati Qurans, suggesting its place of production. Along with this intriguing survival are instances of movement among literary figures. Mir Hashim Kirmani, who died in 1541-42, came to Tata shortly after the Argon conquest and composed the Mazar al-Athar, a Masnavi in imitation of Nizami's Mahzan al-Asrar in 1533-34 while in the city. Similarly, Fakhri Haravi, a panegyrist of Shah Tamas, came to Sindh in the mid-16th century and composed the Jawahir al-Ajayb, notices of 20 poetesses in Sindh, in Tatta. Supporting evidence for design and workshop organization may also be extrapolated from nearby centers. An analogous model for mobility is found in Elizabeth Lambon's work on marble carving in Kambat in Gujarat between the 13th and 15th centuries, which demonstrates the extraordinarily mobile character of Gujarati marble tombstones that traveled all over the Indian Ocean littoral, accompanied perhaps by their makers. Similarly, Timurid royal workshops also shed light on these processes. In particular, the Arzadash, or petition discovered in album Hazine 2153 in the top copy, reveals the integrated nature of the design process for Timurid artistic production, particularly through the description of artists working on designs for multiple mediums, book bindings, illuminations, tents, tiles, etc. The Arabans would have been well acquainted with this model, given their service to the late Timurid sultans, and may have modeled their Sindhi workshops along the same lines. A manuscript of Nizami's Mahsan al-Asrar in the Punjab University Library, dated 953 Hijri, or 1546 CE, and produced in Tatta, certainly ex indicates the existence of such workshops in Sin. While the scarcity of material remains prevents definitive conclusions, the few objects that have survived and the monuments at Makli and Tatta are suggestive of mobility and of the existence of artistic workshops in southern Sin. The migration of the Arhuns and Tarhans to Sin stimulated a demand for monuments that seemed to have made reference to the world they left behind, reflecting a degree of nostalgia, perhaps. It is important to note, however, that these monuments did not indicate an eclipse or erasure of existing artistic traditions, but rather a careful process of selecting motifs with local antecedents. This may have been a means of ensuring continuity and stability in the midst of immense political change, or it may reflect the agency of local artists in determining the balance between adoption and adaptation. Nevertheless, the Arhuns and Tarhan's brief tenure in power transformed the architectural idioms and media of the region. Thank you very much. Now it's turn to uh, request Dr. Margaret S. Grave. Dr. Margaret S. Grave is Assistant Professor of Islamic Art and Architecture at Indiana University, Bloomington. She received her PhD uh, doctorate from University of uh, Edinburgh in 2010. And prior to joining Indiana University in 2012, she worked for the Aga Khan Trust for Culture. She has published articles, catalogs, and edited volumes on uh, medieval Islamic and uh, art and architecture and the 19th century craft production of the Islamic world. Her new book, Arts of Illusion, Object, Ornament, and Architecture in Medieval Islam will be published by Oxford University Press in 2018. Uh, we are talking about uh, Makli, and uh, the topic of her uh, uh, dissertation, her paper is uh, Tomb Rubbing from Sin in the Indiana University of Collections. Please welcome Professor Dr. Margaret S. Graves. As you know, the tomb structures of Sindh include a, a wide variety of forms, but one of the types most strongly identified with the region is the dramatic step slab tomb, or more properly, it's a cenotaph, uh, since the body was interred in the ground under the structure. The many extant variations on this form in Sindh and also in Baluchistan, carved from sandstone, have fascinated scholars since the first examples appeared in academic publications in the early 20th century. For many of the graveyards where these cenotaphs can be found, there's relatively little secure historical information that can be definitively attached to individual tombs or even to the site as a whole. 
This has engendered a range of scholarly approaches that go beyond the historical. The steppe cenotaphs have also been successfully presented as ethnographic and anthropological evidence of tribal structures and practices, also as aesthetic works that can be subjected to stylistic analysis, or they've been explored through a mix of these approaches. Even dating the graves has often been problematic. Few of the inscribed structures at many of the graveyards bear dates, but the scholarly consensus now indicates that this type of tomb structure was made from the 15th to 18th century, with some more recent examples also surviving. So in this paper, I want to focus on a particular case that quite overtly aestheticizes the carvings on these step tombs by extracting them from their original three-dimensional context and reducing them to isolated images and flat patterns. My main subject today is going to be a rather surprising find in the Ashkenazi Museum of Art, which is in Indiana University, my, my institution now, which is in Bloomington in the Midwest of the United States. This is a collection of just over 100 rubbings that were made from the steppe cenotaphs of Sindh in the late 1950s and early 1960s by Madge Minton, a woman from Indianapolis, who subsequently donated them to Indiana University. So I'll expand uh, in a moment on the rubbings in Indiana, and I'll talk about their nature and the circumstances of their collection, which are quite interesting. First, I want to make a couple of more general observations about the step tombs themselves. These are some of the rubbings I'll just show you there. The most elaborate form of this type of cenotaph is sometimes known as a Chaukandi tomb, and of course one of the most celebrated groups is found at the eponymous Chaukandi graveyard near Karachi. Salome uh, Zajadach Hastenrath has provided what's probably the most thorough and certainly the most widely available analysis of the stepped tomb corpus, although I would suggest we may want to re revisit some of her chronological conclusions. However, she convincingly argues that much of the impetus for the changing styles in the construction and decoration of these cenotaphs at various sites is driven by innovations that took place at Makli. So she really located Makli as the, um, the kind of prime site for this, these structures. Although the particular form of the elaborate Chaukandi tomb type doesn't have direct parallels elsewhere in the Islamic world, this doesn't really look exactly like anything from elsewhere in the Islamic world. It, but it does certainly carry resonances of older Islamic burial practices that are now attested primarily in manuscript illustration. The first of these that I'll show you, the Vienna Chart Codex, found at Fayum in Egypt and dated by, uh, dated by Groman and Rice and most recently Geoffrey King to the 9th or 10th century, shows an image of a tree with a three-tiered step cenotaph on either side of it, which you can just about see on either side of the tree. Further images of steppe cenotaphs appear in the paintings of the surviving illustrated Makama manuscripts, which were produced in Iraq, in Egypt, and in Syria between the early 13th and the 14th centuries. Now, the surviving manuscript illustrations represent a variety of possible construction techniques, including baked brick and plastered mud brick and masonry. King has further suggested that this form, the steppe cenotaph form, may once have been found in the Islamic graveyards of the Arabian Peninsula as well, although material remains are now lacking. So the grave markers shown in these paintings are obviously of much more modest dimensions than the towering steppe cenotaphs of the Chaukandi type. However, what these manuscript paintings do show us is that in the medieval imagination across a very significant stretch of the Islamic world, the image of a tomb was a stepped form in masonry or brick. More pragmatically and geographically closer, the mode of slab construction seen in some of the stepped cenotaphs in Sindh recalls some of the tripartite cenotaphs found at Ghazni from the late 10th century, including the tomb of Sebuktigin, shown here. So when viewed against the Ghazni material, the towering stepped form of the Chaukandi type cenotaphs in spite of its innovation in the form of uh, the construction of box plinths, it can still be understood perhaps as the most dramatic and the most spectacular incarnation of a medieval form that attains several distinct regional variations across the Islamic world. But beyond the drama of their silhouettes, it's the carvings on the stepped tombs of Sindh and Baluchistan that have garnered the most popular and scholarly attention. Several authors in earlier scholarship were perplexed by the figural imagery, that is, images of people and of animals, found on these tombs, 
which upended their expectations of Muslim, Muslim orthodoxy. A number of the tombs of this type include figural carvings. Now, primarily what these show are images of mounted warriors, so men on horseback with weapons, although animals also appear sometimes. Um, these are usually discrete, quite contained small panels within much larger non-figural decorative schemes. They have been selected, I think, disproportionately often for publication as details, but they only make up a very small proportion of the existing carved decoration on the step tombs. Now, this example, which is supposedly from Makli, um, includes many of the elements that have made these carvings, these carvings famous. This includes a focus on weaponry, so you have the, the shield. You can see the shield and the sword that the rider is carrying. The elaborate trappings of the horse, which merge fine patterning with figural form, and a very precisely cut, striking silhouette. It's very fine work here. Now, not all of them are as fine, but this is a good example. Reminiscent of the so-called hero stone tradition and attesting certainly to a different set of mores concerning figural representation in Islamic practice from those that dominate today, these images have captured the attention of specialists and amateurs alike. And so now I want to go back to one of those amateurs, which is uh, Madge Minton. Oh, here is an image of her. Madge and Sherman Minton um, were both from the American Midwest. They were actually both from Indiana. You see Madge is shown here during World War II. She actually flew, uh, she flew military planes in World War II. After they met at Indiana University and married during World War II, they lived in Indianapolis and they had three daughters. However, when the eldest of their daughters was 13, they moved to Karachi and they lived in Karachi from 1958 to 1962. Sherman was a medical doctor and microbiologist at the Indiana School of Medicine, and the reason they came to Karachi is he was invited in early 1958 to help establish the Biomedical Sciences Institute of the Karachi School of Medicine. However, Sherman's greatest academic pursuit in some ways was the study of reptiles and amphibians, and he actually published a major monograph on the herpetology of West Pakistan in 1966. As a result of the Minton's time in Pakistan, Indiana University now possesses a considerable number of artifacts from this country. They were acquired by the Mintons during their initial stay from 58 to 62 and on a subsequent visit in 1960, sorry, 58 to 62 and then a subsequent visit in 1965. These pieces are spread across two museums on campus. Currently, the Mother's Museum of World Cultures holds 368 archive, artifacts that came from the Mintons. This includes more than 300 black and white photographs taken between 58 and 62, as well as also they have tiles, jewelry, baskets, clothes, and a very elaborate crib, which is the object I'm showing you here, which is a, a favorite piece in this museum. They were all purchased during the return trip that Madge made to Pakistan in 1965, specifically to acquire materials for the university collections. So that although Indiana is university is not particularly known for its connections with Pakistan now, um, there was actually quite a strong connection in the 1960s. Meanwhile, the Ashkenazi Museum of Art has the group of more than 100 rubbings, which were made with crayon on what seems to be mulberry or silk tissue, uh, or in a few cases in silk fabric. Now, the black and white photographs that were taken during the family's residence in Pakistan attest to a pretty omnivorous interest in the traditions and cultures of their temporary home. Of the 14, pho the 14 photographs of tombs and shrines in the minted photographic collection, there's one that's labeled Chaukandi Tombs Makli Hill, Tata, so they made it to Makli. The other 13 show the Chaukandi site near Karachi, which seems to have been a favorite with them, and the tomb at Sheikh Haji Tarabi. These are two showing the interior of the Haji Tarabi tomb. Um, I'm particularly interested in the stone objects that seem to be devotional offerings in the right-hand image. So if anyone can shed any light on the practice that this represents, I'd be very grateful to hear from them afterwards. So now we come to the rubbings themselves. A few of Mrs. Minton's rubbings are dated, October 1961. They were reportedly all made during that four-year stay in Karachi, during which time the family traveled extensively in Sindh province and beyond. Sherman seems to have spent much of his time in Pakistan traveling around on the hunt for reptile specimens. Um, and he wrote an autobiography. The chapter about their time in Pakistan is almost entirely concerned with field trips to hunt lizards and snakes. 
While he makes no mention in these chapters of what his wife was doing on these trips, one can read between the lines of the reptile hunting expeditions and the microbiological missions to see that she must have, or she was probably making her rubbings of tombs during some of these trips as the sites seem to line up together. Various American and British archaeologists also seem to have stayed with the Mintons during their residence in Karachi, which may also account for some of Madge's site visits. Now, Madge Minton was undoubtedly a resourceful and energetic woman, um, and she was clearly determined to learn about the country that she lived in for four years. There's evidently a great curiosity on her part about Pakistan. She was not, however, a linguist at all. Um, she often transcribed place names and object names as best she could, but she didn't really follow any consistent system. At the same time, there is, of course, the problem of individual sites being known by more than one name, too. So the total list of sites represented in the Indiana rubbing groups, as best as I can work out for Madge's place names, is 10. I'm going to show you all of them, but just very, very quickly to give you a sense of how many pieces we have from each of those sites. So the first is uh, Barabag in, at Las Bella in Baluchistan, um, then Chaukandi itself, then Lako Sheikh graveyard near Malir, Sheikh Haji Tarabi, Dars Waria and Haleji Lake, she got to Mango Pier. There's a site I have not been able to identify where this is. She has it labeled called Little Pier Patho near Garo. So again, if anyone can help me with where this actually is, that would be helpful. She went to Hinadan, Pier Shah Hussein, Pier Patho, Sonda, and Godraj Malik, where she seems to have, she did most of her, the single largest body of rubbings at Godraj Malik. So here's one page, here's more. And she also did this, I think she particularly liked this, um, this panel. She did several, several rubbings of it. It's interesting to consider why she didn't, as far as I can tell, take any rubbings at Makli. Um, my conjecture is that probably the predominantly epigraphic decoration of the tombs at Makli held little interest for Mrs. Minton because she wouldn't have been able to read the inscriptions. As we can see from the rubbings that she made, her interest lay not in the historical content, but really in the purely visual and above all the figural components found on the stepped tombs. Most of the rubbings are labeled in the lower right or lower left corner with the name of the site, sometimes also with some further geographical information. Like here, we have one that says Pirapato, 14 miles east of Tata, um, or more localized information. This one, there's one that says Mango Pier near the crocodile tank. A very few of the rubbings have annotations on the corners in Mrs. Minton's hand alongside the site name. Most of these are really just descriptive. They're clearly intended to help her remember pertinent details afterwards. So they say things like, from the base of the woman's tomb. There are only two that include annotations that refer to something Mrs. Minton thought was inherently remarkable. Uh, in both cases, she was wrong about them. One is a rubbing from Sonda, which shows a mounted warrior and an attendant figure with swords, so that's on the lower the lower right here. Um, above the figures are a, a ring and a gun, and then the gun points towards a figure who trails behind who seems to be female. Mrs. Minton's annotation reads, this is the only known carving of a female figure. It's not true, um, but it's interesting that she thought it was noteworthy. The other annotation is on the rubbing in the upper left from Hinadan, which says two horsemen with crosses in this graveyard. Again, this is not correct. It seems to be a misreading of what lo looked like a, it looks like a sword above the figure. But presumably Mrs. Minton was attracted to the idea of the possibility of Christian imagery or some kind of syncretic um, evidence here. So from this overview of the rubbings made on these elaborate, these elaborate uh, cenotaphs, it's quite clear that Madge Minton was interested primarily in the carvings that had representational content. She seems to have been most attracted to two subjects. First, the so-called heroes, heroes or warriors found on some of the graves of men, and these have attracted attention really since the tombs were first documented. Second, the images of jewelry that adorn some of the graves of women. Only at Barabag, uh, at Chokandi, and at one of the sites near Malir did she treat non-representational geometric designs as a main subject rather than a secondary ornamentation. As a final point, um, it's worth noting that 
Madge Minton was actually not the only American woman making rubbings of cenotaphs in Pakistan in the late 1950s and early 1960s. Another woman called Ethel Jane Bunting also collected very similar rubbings uh, around the same time. She was in residence in Pakistan from 1958 to 1970. She eventually displayed hers in an exhibition um, at the Anthropology Museum of the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque, which was titled Cindy Tombs and Textiles, The Persistence of Pattern. A book was published, this is quite critical, a book was published to accompany that exhibition. Some scholars have suggested that it really accelerated Western interest in the sinned tombs and cenotaphs and their decoration. Just like Madge Minton's rubbings, which I'm showing you here, Ethel Jane Bunting's also tend to isolate and extract sections of figural imagery. She was really using them as springboards from which she moved into discussion of weapons, jewelry, and textiles in the tribal cultures of Sindh and Baluchistan. She makes a very interesting comparison between the geometric designs on some of the cenotaphs and the traditional textile designs, from which I think we can extend her argument and raise the idea that the steppe cenotaphs can be imagined as actually being sort of draped in petrified textiles. Sadly, unlike uh, Mrs. Bunting's rubbings, the rubbings at Indiana University have not had such an illustrious career. Only two have ever been exhibited. They were included in a large loan exhibition of Islamic art that was mounted at the university in 1970, but the rest have never been on display. Generally speaking, I think it's fair to say that nobody at the art museum really knows what to do with them. Being traces or records of other artifacts, rather than the artifacts themselves, they don't fit easily into the traditional categories of the art museum. And there was in the past some discussion about transferring them to the Museum of World Cultures, uh, but Ultimately, I don't think anyone actually cared enough about them to do it. So this is how they were when I found them uh, in 2015. All but the two that had been displayed in 1970, all the rest of them were still rolled up in these tubes that they had been stored in since they had been accessioned. The Asian art curator for the museum and I unrolled and photographed them all in 2015. Um, as with all such collections formed on the basis of personal taste rather than objective quote unquote objective scientific principles. The rubbings in the Indiana University collection tell us I think probably more about the collector than they do about the material that she wanted to capture with tissue paper and crayons. Madge Minton was not alone in her fascination for the figural imagery found on the tombs of Sindh and Baluchistan. What is really surprising about this material is finding it in the American Midwest. This is not a place where we would expect to be looking for material from Pakistan. At this stage, I'm working with the museum to formalize a research project on the Minton rubbing collection and give it some of the attention that it, it should have had years ago. The first and the most important component of this research will be to identify the individual rubbings with the extant tombs and particularly to ascertain if any of them record monuments that are no longer in existence or that have been damaged since the early 1960s. Um, so I want to establish whether any of the things that we have, the rubbings, have particular documentary value in that sense. This is, of course, going to require collaboration. Uh, Dr. Calhoro has been very helpful with this so far. A second component of the research on this project is further investigation into the Mintons and their collecting practices. The other part of this story is that Madge Minton actually acquired a lot of material from Pakistan, almost 100 pieces, um, that went to the American Museum of Natural History in New York, which is, of course, a very major, very celebrated museum. So the Indiana University materials can be looked at together with the New York pieces to try to draw larger conclusions about the kinds of material that was being collected and what kinds of curiosity and taste American institutions had for Pakistani materials in the early years of the nation state. A third outcome from this project will be a temporary exhibition of the minting rubbings at Indiana University, perhaps alongside some of the other Pakistani materials there, so that these interesting pieces can finally be brought out into the light where they should be. Thank you very much. Uh, talking about uh, documented history of uh, Makli, we have a recent document by Mir Ali Sher Khan at Hatvi. Uh, that is called Makli Nama, which was extended in Sindhi by Peter Samadhin Shah Rajdi afterwards. Uh, talking about uh, various glimpses of this uh, uh, book, this document, this account, we have uh, Dr. Homera Nas. Dr. Homera Nas is currently associated with uh, uh, the Department of History, University of Karachi, as assistant professor. She has extensive teaching and research experience at the uh, university level. 
She has attended and presented her research papers in almost 30 conferences and seminars of national and international repute in Pakistan and abroad, such as United States of America, Australia, Turkey, Malaysia, India, Uzbekistan, and Iran, etc. She has uh, conducted and attended several workshops on history, career development, and professional skills. Her several articles have been published in internationally uh, indented uh, research journals and acknowledged research journals and uh, renowned uh, newspapers, as well as in the proceedings of national and international conferences. She has also undertaken some uh, research projects, including currently submitted to the Research Center of Islamic History, Art and Culture, Organization of Islamic Cooperation, OIC, uh, Istanbul, Turkey, which is titled as The History and Culture of the Muslim Nations, Muslim State of Sindh. Her field of study is medieval Indian history, Muslim empires of the medieval times, and history of Sindh. She has been associated with some research journals of uh, social sciences and humanities as the member of advisory board and evaluation committee. Uh, the topic of her paper is some glimpses from Makli Nama, and uh, historical monuments of Makli Hills, uh, especially focusing the historical monuments of Makli Hills and those glimpses which are mentioned by Kane in uh, Makli Nama, which is the source of, uh, which is a prominent source of uh, Kaloda period, and uh, uh, she will be talking about those glimpses. Let me request Dr. Homera Nas to please come and to present her paper. Assalamu alaikum and a very good day here at Makli, the audience. And before starting my talk, I would uh, like to congratulate uh, the Department of uh, uh, Culture, uh, Tourism and Antiquities, Government of Sindh, for organizing such a great event. Uh, as uh, a study of the primary sources has always been my specific uh, field of interest and research, that's why for the today's talk, I have already selected a source which is uh, uh, definitely about uh, related about the Makli monuments, the uh, so name of the source is Bustane Bahar, which is commonly known as uh, the Makli Nama. So there are numerous books which are compiled uh, during the medieval period, which give uh, worthy information about the sacred burial uh, places of the mystic saints, uh, such as in Hirat, Samarkand, and Bukhara, etc. These compilations seize the attention of the scholars due to inimitability of their topic. The Bustane Bahar, which is uh, known as Makli Nama of Ali Sher Khane Thatwi, also falls in this category, which is very unique in its uh, contents and spirit. This compilation is not only highly devotional, but informative as well. It may be regarded as the foremost record of the necropolis of Makli Hills. The earliest period of the burials on Makli Hills precedes uh, the authorship of Makli Nama by more than four centuries. The author Mir Ali Sher Khane Thatwi was a great scholar and he was a historian of uh, his times who possessed understanding to address the historical issues. He took uh, this challenge assignment without the support of any potential sponsor and his main objective uh, 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 this was about the author and now I would like to explain the main objective of the compilation. So the main objective and motive was to bring some interesting fa facts about Makli to limelight. Another task behind this compilation was to incorporate uh, the Masnavi of the author uh, that text in, within the text of Makli Nama which he successfully accomplished. He wished to have some uh, composition that uh, should stand out as a literary piece of writing that might establish his extraordinary talents with the pen. In this manner, it made available to wider circle of readership. Thus, the Makli Nama is a combination of poetry and prose with the reminiscence of the past not very distant. The period of compilation. However, uh, this masterpiece of Alishar Khan Thatvi was completed in 1760 as the chronogram given at the end of the text mentions a date of compilation in a couplet. Now we talk about uh, the content of the book from the viewpoint of its subject. Masli, Makli Nama includes the history of important heritage of Makli graveyard. Kane, a great 
poet laureate and historian composed this work in a composite frame of highly literary prose embellished with the admirable poetry in order to pay homage to the great souls interned in the makli graveyard he furnishes brief introduction of the famous sufi saints such as sheikh isa langoti sheikh sheikh hamad qazi abdullah sheikh jia sayyid muhammad yusuf rizvi peer sheikh aliya peer ghaib and mulla daud ras describing the architectural and historical significance of the monuments which are associated with them The book also tells us about magnificence of the burial places of Jinjam Nizamuddin Arnando and Mirza Isa Tar Khan etc. The physical and historical uh, geography of these monuments is the particular interest of the author. He describes charm and beauty along with historical significance of some shrines and monasteries like Peer Asta, Shah Priya Chashma Naran, Sarv, Maabad, Kalkan, Khair Sar Talab, Jalwa Gahe, Imam, Imamin, Arze Park, Mola, and some caves and temples of the Hindus, etc. Praising for the water of well, he writes, for drinking the sweet water for the visitors, also for the expenses use of those who look after the place is a well. more blessed than zamzam and brighter than the fountain of the eyes of the pious people quote and unquote occasionally uh, the book includes records of epigraph installed at the monuments beside the biographical details of the renowned saints of sin the author also mentions related events of historical significance the sacred people who are the subject of the book devoted their lives in spreading the message of love and humanity they also played a vital role in the socio political milieu of the era some of these people even brought to be buried at this prestigious necropolis of makli which was perhaps regarded as the most revered site over here Uh, the makli nama depicts a very good picture of makli describing the socio cultural life of the 18th century sindh especially thatta one of the authors statement mentions that trend of having betel leaf was in vogue among the people of thatta on such joyous occasions as he writes i quote betel eaters with a leaf and a red preparation on the green leaf inside it the betel and lime are a treatment of the fever of heart unquote highlighting the traditional celebrations at the shrine of makli hill the author writes at another place i quote on every side the arrangements of shops and two lanes of beautiful bazaars are such that the sides slip narrowly and hearts willingly by the wear of happiness the money changers out the vanity of riches do not give importance to malik dinar and because of heaps of paisas and rupees are knowledgeable unquote as the author in a way had remained a part of bureaucratic hierarchy he observed each and every social move very keenly however he could not possibly perceive degeneration of the society and loss of its strength but could feel the gloom this state of melancholy might have caused him to get into despair the situation prompted him on a sentimental journey to the historic graveyard he in his zeal even did not care to restrict himself to one genre of expression kane weaves very softly an image of the city of thatta as a reporter whose expositions are of great interest to the students of sociology and anthropology he highlights the devotional spirit abundantly vibrant in the society that was undergoing degeneration generally and in particularly the economy was facing a situation of stagnation the ports associated with thatta were long abandoned and silted the crafts associated with the exports were at its lowest ebb tide 
the author makes available an account that provide an exposition of the society which had intimate attachment of makli he describes how various groups of the public masses from thatta came to enjoy visiting the necropolis of makli he succeeds in capturing the